the um, academic Rudine Sims Bishop talks about the importance of young people having both mirrors and windows in their literature. Mirrors that so that they see reflections of themselves on the page and windows so that people can see into the worlds of other people. As a young person wanting to, dreaming of being a writer, Toni Morrison's book, um, The Bluest Eye, gave me both mirrors and windows. As a per young brown girl, Toni Morrison, as an African-American writer, showed me that I too could be a writer. So I am deeply honored to be here tonight introducing the Nobel Pulitzer Prize and President Medal Award for Freedom winning author, um, among many, many, many more awards that I know y'all know, I hope y'all know. Um, and Toni, Ms. Morrison will be talking, be in conversation with another award-winning novelist, nonfiction, TV writer extraordinaire, Veronica Chambers. And Veronica and I are pals from Brooklyn. Veronica's work has historically honored the people who have been absent in the pages of literature, just as Ms. Morrison's work has done. So it is with great honor that I give you tonight, Ms. Toni Morrison and Ms. Veronica yeah. Chambers. Thank you. It's a beautiful day. Finally, and you all came out, and I came out, and I'm going to read a couple of pages from God Help the Child, which I hope will make you so fascinated. <laughs> Let me see, he said how long, and I said two pages, but it's more than that. Anyway. Uh, the book is broken up into voices of a number of people to drag along the main theme. And the first person is sweetness. It's not my fault. So you can't blame me. I didn't do it, and I have no idea how it happened. It didn't take more than an hour after they pulled her out from between my legs to realize something was wrong, really wrong. She was so black, she scared me. Midnight black, Sudanese black. I'm light-skinned, with good hair, what we call high yellow. And so is Lula Ann's father. Ain't nobody in my family anywhere near that color. Tar is the closest I can think of, yet her hair don't go with the skin. It's different, straight but curly, like those naked tribes in Australia. You might think she's a throwback, but throwback to what? You should have seen my grandmother. She passed for white and never said another word to any one of her children. Any letter she got from my mother or my aunts, she sent right back, unopened. Finally, they got the message of no message and let her be. Almost all mulatto types and quadroons did that back in the day, if they had the right kind of hair, that is. Can you imagine how many white folks have Negro blood running and hiding in their veins? Guess. 20%, <clears throat> I heard. My own mother, Lula Mae, could have passed easy, but she chose not to. She told me the price she paid for that decision. When she and my father went to the courthouse to get married, there were two Bibles, and they had to put their hands on the one reserved for Negroes. The other one was for white people's hands, the Bible. Can you beat it? My mother was a housekeeper, housekeeper for a rich white couple. They ate every meal she cooked and insisted she scrubbed their backs while they sat in the tub. God knows what other intimate things they made her do. But no touching of the same Bible. Some of you probably think it's a bad thing to group ourselves according to skin color, the lighter the better, in social clubs, neighborhoods, churches, sororities, even colored schools. But how else can we hold on to a little dignity? How else can you avoid being spit on 
in a drugstore, shoving elbows at the bus stop, walking in the gutter to let whites have the whole sidewalk, charged a nickel at the groceries for a paper bag that's free to white shoppers, let alone all the name calling. I heard about all of that and much, much more. But because of my mother's skin color, she wasn't stopped from trying on hats in the department stores or using their ladies' room. And my father could try on shoes in the front part of the shoe store, not in a back room. Neither one would let themselves drink from a colored-only fountain, even if they were dying of thirst. I hate to say it. But from the very beginning, in the maternity ward, the baby, Lula Ann, embarrassed me. Her birth skin was pale, like all babies, even African ones, but it changed fast. I thought I was going crazy when she turned blue-black right before my eyes. I know I went crazy for a minute because once, just for a few seconds, I held a blanket over her face and pressed, but I couldn't do that, no, how mad, no matter how much I wish she hadn't been born with that terrible color. I even thought of giving her away to an orphanage someplace, and I was scared to be one of those mothers who put their babies on church steps. Recently, I heard about a couple in Germany, white as snow, who had a dark-skinned baby Nobody could explain. Twins, I believe. One white, one colored. But I don't know if it's true. All I know is that for me, nursing her is like having a pickaninny sucking at my teeth. I went to bottle feeding as soon as I got home. My husband, Lewis, is a porter. And when he got back off the rails, he looked at me like I really was crazy, and looked at her like she was from the planet Jupiter. He wasn't a custom man, so when he said, God damn, what the hell is this? <laughs> I knew we were in trouble. That's what did it, what caused the fights between me and him. It broke our marriage to pieces. We had three good years together, but when she was born, he blamed me and treated Lula Ann like she was a stranger. More than that, an enemy. He never touched her. I never did convince him that I ain't never, ever fooled around with another man. He was dead sure I was lying. We argued and argued till I told him her blackness be from his own family, not mine. That's when it got worse. So bad he just jumped up and left. And I had to look for another cheaper place to live. I knew enough not to take her with me when I applied to landlords. So I s left her with a teenage cousin to babysit. I did the best I could. I didn't take her outside much anyway because when I pushed her in the baby carriage, Friends or strangers would lean down and peek in to say something nice, and they'd give a start and jump back before frowning. That hurt. I could have been the babysitter if our skin colors were reversed. It was hard enough just being a colored woman, even a high yellow one, trying to rent in a decent part of the city. Back in the 90s, when Lula Ann was born, the law was against discriminating in who you could rent to, but not many landlords paid attention to it. They made up reasons to keep you out. But I got lucky with Mr. Lee. I know he upped the rent $7 from what he advertised, and he has a fit if you're a minute late with the money. I told her to call me sweetness instead of mother or mama. It was safer. Being that black and having what I think a 
too thick lips calling me mama would confuse people. Besides, she has funny colored eyes, crow black with a blue tint. Something witchy about them, too. So it was just us two for a long while. And I don't have to tell you how hard it is being an abandoned wife. I guess Lewis felt a little bit bad after leaving us like that because a few months later on, he found out where I moved to and started sending me money once a month, though I never asked him to and didn't go to court to get it. His $50 money orders and my night job at the hospital got me and Lula Ann off welfare, which was a good thing. I wish they would stop calling it welfare and go back to the word they used when my mother was a girl. Then it was called relief. Sounds much better. Like it's just a short-term breather while you get yourself together. Besides, those welfare clerks are mean as spit. When finally I got work and didn't need them anymore, I was making more money than they ever did. I guess meanness filled out their skimpy paychecks, which is why they treated us like beggars, more so when I took, more so when they looked at Lula Ann and back at me like I was cheating or something. Things got better, but I still had to be careful, very careful in how I raised her. I had to be strict, very strict. Lula Ann needed to learn how to behave, how to keep her head down and not to make trouble. I don't care how many times she changes her name, her color, is a cross she will always carry. But it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not. Okay. I'm just gonna move this in a little so we can hear you better. Okay. Sure. Hello. Amazing. I want to say thank you to Jackie Woodson for the great introduction and, you know, congratulations to her for all her amazing awards, the National Book Award, Coretta Scott King Award. I just feel like as part of our generation, you've so hewn to the standard of excellence that Miss Morrison has put forward for us. <laughs> and, and, um, Thank you to Andy Ward and the Free Library, my very favorite library in the world. And thank you to Miss Eileen and Miss Morrison. When I started the book, it really took me back to a place because I, I grew up in one of those families. You know, I had relatives who would greet me at the door and say, if you're light, you're all right. If you're brown, <laughs> stick around. If you're black, get back. And to them, I was Sudanese black. And when I read the first chapter of the book, I was struck by how immediately you remind us that this isn't just some people's foolishness or some people's sort of psyche about color, that it's rooted in something really historical in our culture and this reach for dignity. Um, so can you talk about sweetness and about her, how she opens the book? Well, I thought, um Uh, I was reminded of the difference between my relationship to neighbors and school children when I was a kid because I never lived in a black neighborhood. I lived in a poor neighborhood, but that was all immigrants and people from Poland and Czechoslovakia and Italy, Mexico. We were all starving to death, that's all. So we didn't have the energy or the time <laughs> <coughs> to, you know, separate ourselves out in racial, racist or racial terms. However, when I went away to school in Washington, D.C., I was the first aware of what we call skin privileges in, as she says, sororities and so on. And it took me a little while because I didn't, no, 
that it was so ingrained, and the purposes for it were seemed natural. Uh, you could get more socially. I don't mean uh, within the group, but I mean outside. When I first went away, I was in a segregated city where there were places I couldn't go, and there were department stores that I couldn't change clothes in. There were ladies, I, we all knew which store they let you go to the bathroom in. There was one, so we figured that out. And so there was limitations on the public transportation and so on. So that was one level of separation. But within the group, that other level of skin privileges was stunning to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just didn't know what it was about. And some of it was uh, hurtful, well not hurtful, but it impressed me in a, academics uh, because I was a, classics minor and an English major. And I would propose things, say I remember once asking my professor, could I write about uh, black people in Shakespeare? <laughs> you know, Othello and the <laughs> Tempest and all that. He was so upset. He said, what? <laughs> That's not a worthy topic or something, you know, and I felt very bad after he scolded me about choosing something so unworthy of the bard. So anyway, what it did for me is, um, I you know, continued to take the class, of course, but I moved to the theater because they read differently for parts. Right. They approached Shakespeare and anybody quite differently from the way it was approached in um, the English departments and so on. So I'm a little drift and far away from the heart of your question, but it does suggest my initial awareness of these privileges and just the notion of what, I mean, what, were, what one could be proud of or not. You know, that was always a, a, a problem uh, there, not just in color, but in other ways as well. Right. So that, well, I don't know, it, it's clear, I think, for those people and readers who have know much about my work is that it was the very first, that problem was in the very first book mm -hmm. I ever wrote. Yep. Not so much for that reason, but because I thought at the time I published The Bluest Eye, all of the books about and by African Americans was very highly revolutionary, you know, get whitey books, I called them. <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, I th and Black is Beautiful and so on. I thought, <coughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. <coughs> there was somebody that was not written about. Mm -hmm. Or if she was, she was a joke. She was topsy, or mammies, and you know, little people. Um, no one took her seriously. Hmm. No one. So that's when I started. This book, of course, is a arc away from that because even though her mother's unnerved, she takes her blackness very seriously right. Right. and wins. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to me because. Uh, well, I have a couple of questions I wanted to ask you in this topic. One is the thought that Bride, you know, for the way that the book starts, Bride very quickly comes into the place where she knows her beauty and is able to use it. And when you talk about your own undergraduate years and, and this kind of skin privilege, it seems to me that you are someone who, I've seen the pictures, you've always been very beautiful, have not invested in that in the way that bride sort of begins to reject it and looks for something bigger and wholer. Is that a too personal question? <laughs> no, I'll tell you a personal story. <clears throat> when I was a little girl, four or five or six, my great grandmother came to town and she was from Flint, Michigan. Everybody talked about her like she was the second coming or something. 
very devoted. She was so special. And she did come to visit us. And she, it's the first time I saw a woman walk into a room and all the men stood up. All my little fresh uncles and things <laughs> stood up. And she had a cane. Anyway, this woman came to our house. It's very odd for a little kid to see your mother on the one hand, your grandmother, and then this other older woman. My grandmother was swinging her legs, you know, her ankles, like she was a little girl in front of this woman. So anyway, she had a lot of influence. Point being, cut to the chase, Tony. <laughs> she came into my, our house, and she looked at me and my sister, and she said, those girls have been tampered with. She was really blue-black. And in her mind, we were impure. Wow. We had been tampered with. And you can imagine how much weight that had for me in Paradise. Wow. The book I wrote yeah. about this town that was just full of very, very black people who carried it like purity and hated everybody, just the opposite, yep. which is all to say that this color thing is <laughs> freighted, shall we say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because you begin to act just like the people that you were running away from yeah. in some instances. But that says something about my own curiosity about the place of color. Uh, it got all mixed up with race, which has nothing to do with it, nothing. And, you know, we use racism. I mean, nobody comes out of the womb, excuse me, sweetness, thinking, oh, I hate <laughs> Chinese people, oh, I hate black people. You don't get both, that has to be taught. You have to learn that. It's not natural. And when you learn it, then you figure out what to do with it, believe it, not believe it, or believe it when it's convenient or what have you. Um, but on the other hand, uh, these you can be glamorous now, as this child, as she's talking about, Lula Ann becomes, a, you know, she's successful in the cosmetics industry, she's beautiful, she knows it, she flaunts it, and people see her and they gasp, because she really is beautiful. Um, a question that I have in terms of the ways in which this book echoes some of the themes of the bluest eye is, are children reliable narrators? Nah, nobody's all that reliable. <laughs> <coughs> you mean the voice of the, I just, I mean, I, of I, the bluest eye voice? Yeah, and also just their memories of things. Like when I think back to what bride remembers and I mean because I actually think in some ways in this book they feel very that the children remember things very accurately that Rain does and Bride and that Booker does but it's one of those questions that I guess maybe because we have a tendency to under because we don't think children know everything you know in real life we have a tendency to to I don't know diminish the truth of children mm -hmm. I'm, I'm struck by the way these children are very strong narrators of their story and of the details of their story. Well, it depends on what you do with it. Right. I mean, what Booker remembers is traumatic and accurate, reliable, etc. And the same thing with the uh, bride. She remembers how she wanted her mother to just slap her so she could touch her at some point. Uh, but they carry that accurate memory, which is a burden. And the whole point is it determines everything in their lives. And they never become three-dimensional people until they have a long sequence of taking care of somebody else. Forget you and your little problems and your little regrets. I got a million. <laughs> but you really have to move beyond that, you know, t to be a complete or nearly complete 
intelligent and generous human being. You know, that was pretty much what the book was driving toward, and sweetness even okay. mentions at the end, yeah. Right. Because they're right, they were mistreated, they're right, this was terrible, they have big regrets, and they begin to operate on that. Mm -hmm. And those burdens cripple them. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't, I mean, it's good if they don't. Right. But it's very often true of all of us. Right, you know, I think that the, um, the moments that Bride and Booker have with Queen, it reminds me of the Gwendolyn Brooks quote, that, that we are each other's harvest, we mm. are each other's business. Um, do you, did you feel like that's part of the growing up of Bride? I mean, there's a whole element in which she seems to be regressing, and then she kind of grows up again in the book. Yeah, she has chapters, moments on her journey. Uh, when she takes, one of the more important one was not just the couple, who took care of her when she had that accident, but that young girl who had a really seriously problematic life, and she's like 10, yeah. and she's tough. Yeah. And she's not gonna <laughs> rain. <Yes. laughs> Nothing bothers her. I mean, you know, I might kill her. No, I guess I won't, you know, yeah. and so on. But, so she saw these levels of other kinds of tr childhood trauma, yeah. and some people won, even the woman in the prison, yeah. you know, she began to think about that. Right. So all of these things put her in a certain position to arrive with Queen and to confront him. And finally they do, the together, they do something for somebody they both respect and like. And then they can come out on the other end. Right. It's not all pure and unadulterated happy endings. <laughs> as you can tell from the title, because the last word is sweetness. Yes. <laughs> and she's hopeful, but she says, good luck. <laughs> I felt like that was kind of a message to parents everywhere. <laughs> you think you're doing it right, but good luck with that. <laughs> well, she, what she's right about, I'll tell you, all of you, is um, the world changes when you're a parent. Not just you, you change, but the world changes. The way you look at it. You know, they have something brand new now called, what do they call the kids are out by themselves? What? Free range, Free range kids. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, when I was little, I have to tell you, they wouldn't even let me back in the house. You know, they said, <laughs> go outside and play. <laughs> And we went outside and played. And there were all sorts of people around who were looking at you in case you did something. And we came back to eat. And we went outside. Now it's like, as you say, free range. It's like, it's a brutality to let your, two of them got arrested, the mother twice, because her kids went to Central Park or something, walking down the street. And that's called child abuse. I don't know, it's just too complicated <laughs> <laughs> for me now. You can see why I didn't want to write this book. Did I you not want to write this book? Well, I started, started, it, right? I started home. Right. I started this book and then I thought, oh, it's too, I don't know what's going on in the contemporary world. It was so strange. Uh, so I wrote home and then I came back and I figured out how I could do it about this subject. But the world looked to me very slippery, you know. Just like uh, I, yesterday, uh, I saw a video of a woman in Baltimore mm -hmm. beating up her son yeah. for being out in the streets about to get involved in the violence. And she said, later, I don't want him to be a Freddie Gray. And now she's being accused of child abuse yeah. by some people who are right now. What is she doing? Hitting her 16, 17 year old son. Mm -hmm. So you say, <laughs> yeah. you know, there, it just, every rule is broken and is wrong and whatever your instincts are and so on. And it's very confusing because there's so much said, yeah. you know, and people have 
you know, so many ways in which to express their opinions. But this free range versus go outside and play is big. Is a big thing for me because I have grandchildren. I mean, I have grandchildren who are in their twenties, but I have some that are under teens, you know, and they don't go outside to play. They do everything but. I mean, they have activities and cellos and horseback riding and tennis and da 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 da. da. Do they play PlayStation? I was oh no to no see no! The word PlayStation in the Toni Morrison novel. I have to say, I never thought I'd see the day. No, I'm a non-nerd. I don't know what anybody's <laughs> doing. So, but that's, it's different. It's very different. Was it freeing to write something so contemporary? Because it's not been since maybe Tar Baby? That the it was interesting so in a way. The, the research was, was different, you know. Uh, for the other books that are set in periods, you know, there's some very solid research if I want to know something, you know. Uh, for this one, you know, is there really a subway in L.A.? <laughs> and the copy editor said, no, there's no, 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 no. Uh, there are northern ash trees up north. You know, it's just stuff like that. And I would scream back at her and say, I got one in my yard. And then, <laughs> <laughs> but it's placing, you know, the geography was so wild and different. But I was very clear about the industry that she was in, right. the cosmetic, cosmetic industry. industry. Yeah. You know, I knew a lot about that, not personally, but it was easy to find. Because the whole point, well, so this concept of beauty, you know, is interesting to me. And there's some little hidden licenses in the book <laughs> where she says, I, uh, I guess it's her designer, her yeah. personal designer, who says, White girls and brown girls have to get naked to get this much attention. <laughs> and when you look at the advertisements and in the newspapers and in the fashion magazines, everybody's, ain't gonna, no one has any clothes on. <laughs> so you know, there were those things that were very different from the you know, 40s or the 50s right. and earlier. So. Showing everything but one little thing. The yeah. one thing or the two things which we call nipples, <laughs> which I think is the easiest, less I mean it's the first thing you touch when you're born. It's nourishing, comforting, available. <laughs> it has no and it's the one thing that they keep covering up right. in the little <laughs> pictures. <laughs> And I'm not sure why that is. Right. Well, there's a lot of things I'm not sure of, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll just keep on. <laughs> well, you do a good job of portraying <laughs> that world, and it's ironic that Bride becomes so big in cosmetics when she herself doesn't wear makeup. No, no. And She's too beautiful. And that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I was really struck by some of the friendships in this book the relationship between Rain and Bride and the relationship between Bride and Brooklyn. There's a genuine, genuineness there between them, despite the race differences, that really goes without a huge commentary about difference. Um, did that feel new to you to write? No, I mean, I thought, you know, there are whole industries in which black, white, dreads, straight hair, Afro's not doesn't matter. Uh, we may like it's comforting to think of these things in blocks, but in real life, it's just not like that. Right. And somebody who you believe who takes care of you may not be your friend. They may just be waiting for opportunity to take your job, right. which is one case. And this little girl who's been horribly abused is adores Bride. And the two of them are like schoolgirls, even though there's, you know, 20 years or less, 15 years between them. So it doesn't have anything to do, that connection may not have anything to do with race or color or age or, you know, these are wholly different people, wholly different. And sometimes it's helpful and sometimes it's not, but you get to be 
a little tough, then you can deal with all kinds of people. Right. You know, um, I was so interested in Steve and Evelyn and their relationship with Rain because they seem confident that they saved her, but she says she that they stole her. And I was wondering if, you know, there's this kind of like bigger like loophole in love in which sometimes you think you're saving somebody and they feel like you're stealing them. And I wondered if you could talk about that. Because well, she doesn't seem to look to them as pure saviors. No, she's mistrustful. But she's a kid and they're 50 years old. And she, they take her and they save her literally. And she appreciates it. But she thinks it's not a, she'd rather have a sister than a, a mother right. um, because of her own relationship with her own mother. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that she's uh, ungrateful. Right. I just think there's a different kind of relationship that she can have with somebody who's, say, 23 right. than somebody closer. who's 50, even though they're the ones who saved her lives in a sense and provide everything for her. And her judgment is pretty good, but she's still a kid. Yeah. I wanted to um, ask you about your friendship with the Obamas. And I was, is that bad? <laughs> I, I just was thinking about, I was reading about your father, and I was wondering whether or not they are a couple or and I, the, the position that they hold is something that he could imagine or that you would have wished he could see. I don't know. Just two different times. And my father's very different. Uh, I, I, I can't generalize about him. And the Obama couple, whom I admire a lot, particularly Michelle Obama, um, and I'm, I wish I were their friends, uh, but we don't have that kind of relationship. Don't want to overstate it. <laughs> Please. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about the novel being set in California. Did you oh. spend time out there? Is that a landscape that's been part of your No, life? well, a little. My son went to Berkeley and I was in and out. And I have friends there. I don't stay a long time because I'm from, you know, Lake Erie and <clears throat> Ohio you know, northern Ohio. And uh, I get a little nervous in California because there are no seasons. <laughs> I keep waiting for some massive change, like fall <laughs> or winter, and it never comes, you know? So I'm, you know, sort of geographically, I feel out of place. It doesn't mean I'm not happy there and I don't appreciate everything and people out there have been very, very nice to me. The one thing I think is gonna make the big difference is the fact that I used to see all of the time when I was a kid, the Milky Way. There was no light pollution in a little tacky little town in Ohio in the 30s and I haven't seen it since. And I've been to Brazil. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, we have it. Go up to Minas Gerais, and it's up there all the time. I go up there, it's not there. And then some, it's over in Wisconsin, we have it, yeah, it's not there. But I am told by a friend of mine who has a little place up in the hills that it's there every night, every night. A carpet of stars and the Milky Way and shooting stars. Wow. And I would like to see that before I die. Okay. So I am, okay, California, I know you ain't got no water, but <laughs> I'm coming out there to see the Milky Way. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have, I'm gonna ask you one more question before we go to the audience. And um, I read recently, a writer named Saeed Jones wrote that the idea of Toni Morrison has been so important for many of us for so long that even when she's sitting right here in front of us, we can't see her in the midst of her own blazing light. And I was wondering, um, no, 
But as I've read the press around you, and I thought about the ways in which you keep staring us back to the work, and we keep wanting to ask you questions about what you're eating and what you're watching, and <laughs> do you go to the movies? And we just, is that discomforting? Is that unexpected for you? Would you like us to stop? <laughs> Well, there are two people operating. First of all, the reason I love this kind of thing is not just to read to audiences and get questions, but I really like, this is the only time I get to meet readers. Everything else is, you know, some conversation on the radio or interview or something, but they're real live people. So I really and truly like that. But there are two people that are functioning here. My name is Chloe. Walford, and my other name is Tony Morrison. Tony Morrison is sort of out there. <laughs> Chloe Walford is not, <laughs> and she's the one who writes the books and stays home and doesn't answer the phone and doesn't have all these little buttons and things and, you know, as a non-nerd that my son is so annoyed that I don't remember anything about what he said I should do on the computer and the this <laughs> and the that. So I am content to have these two separate faces, both of whom are very nice. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. But they have different functions. Yes. That's all. <laughs> okay, so do we have questions from the audience for... Miss Tony Martin. I think I read that before becoming a novelist, you spent a lot of time as an editor. And I wonder if you would tell us who are some of the writers whose works you edited and how did being an editor uh, help or otherwise impact your writing as a novelist? That's an interesting question. I um, was a teacher before I was an editor, which means that you have distance. Uh, and I approached editing that way. That was about what bringing out the best that they could do. It didn't have anything to do with what I was doing. And some of the people were fiction people like uh, Tony Cade Bambara and Gail Jones. Uh, there were people who were well-known figures, you know, like Muhammad Ali and Angela Davis and so on. Each of those categories and each of those people had something quite, quite different in their recollections, memoirs, or um, and, and the other kind of management you do with fiction once you know what their style is. You know, the difference between Gail Jones or Henry Dumas and Tony K. Bambar is all the difference in the world. You know, the only thing they had in common was they were all African Americans, and that was it. So, but if you have had any time uh, monitoring student papers. You know how to bring up the, what they think they're saying, you know, make it clearer, and then separate yourself when you're doing your own, your own work. Ms. Morrison, earlier today I was chatting with a friend of mine who happens to be an Orthodox Jewish woman who lives in Baltimore. And she, of course, like the rest of us, are just, just is very distraught about what's happening there. And she wanted to know, so on behalf of her, she wanted to know if you had words of encouragement and empowerment for the young people who feel that they are not heard and whose anger and pain is starting to erupt in the ways that we've seen. I sort of think they know what to do. And uh, the idea of um, I don't know, I hear different things. Something I read today or yesterday morning about somebody on television who was being chastised a bit because of the violence and the uh, terrible things that were going on with the destruction of windows and cars being on fire and so on. And the man said, you are more worried about broken windows than you are about broken necks. So there's something about the so-called riot, and of course, 
you know, when they were marching peacefully, there were no media down there at all. Um, it's only the, when it begins to be hurtful and, you know, some people come in that you find this, you know, look what's happening. You know, I don't know, Baltimore's been like that since the beginning of time. And for me, among the things I think about this particular incident with this man, uh, Freddie Gray, and so many of the others, is many people say, yeah, they never, the police never always get off, and this and that. I know that there are some very responsible policemen, but I have to say, they have become such cowards. I really mean that. Can you? And they say, I was in fear for my life with a 12 year old kid. And somebody's running away from you fast, and you're afraid of their backs. I mean, it's just, it's the, the none of it in that regard is making sense. I thought, this, well, we've been through so many of them, you see, and the narrative is always the same. The people who uh, march peacefully are wonderful. The people who throw things are bad people, and that keeps us from going in between those two areas into the heart of the problem, which is living in a very, very scary place where, as we learned in Ferguson, 40% of the budget of the little community was in fines, you know, for taillights and what they do. They stop you. It's like almost every racist uh, philosophy. It makes money. That's the only reason it's around. It makes money and it makes people who don't like themselves very much have somebody to despise. That's all. If you're confident, you don't need it. But since slavery, which is a money maker, it brought this country from nothing into the Industrial Revolution in less than 20 years. It never would have made it to be competitive with Europe in those years, never, without constant bringing in of free labor that you had to steal. Don't get me started. This is about <laughs> something. I've always been so awestruck by your character development, and I wondered if they're based ever on people that you've known, or kind of a synopsis or a metamorphosis of people you've experienced, but they're almost so real that you wonder if it was an actual person. Once. The first book I wrote was based on my relationship with a friend as a child who we were having a conversation about God and she said he didn't exist and I said, oh, but he does. And I was convinced and she was convinced that he wasn't. Finally, she said, I have proof. And her proof was that she had been praying for two years for blue eyes and he hadn't shown up. <laughs> but the other thing was that when I looked at her, I thought two things. One, she would have been really awful if he had d delivered them. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing I thought, and I was, I don't think I was 10 years old, because you don't think in those terms at that age. I thought she was beautiful. I mean, she really was, and that's not a word that, that's not a 10-year-old word. You think of cute and other, but you know, something elevated. She had these high cheekbones, these big almond eyes, this lovely, and this is the first time I recognized it. Now, I never, uh, I had a kind of a maybe shadow character that would be Claudia's sister, because I have a sister who's about my age, and we, were very close at that time. But since that time, I have never ever found a person whose character or whose being I wanted to write about. 
uh, maybe I didn't know enough, but they weren't interesting enough <laughs> for me to, <laughs> to uh, write about them. And I really prefer, even when I'm not, you know, I really prefer uh, ima the creation, the imagining of something, you know, even when it's difficult. And when I wrote Song of Solomon, I had a very clear idea of what that was going to be. And then I thought of this character, Pilot, out of thin air. And that character literally fought me for control of the book. <laughs> and I thought, I don't think so. <laughs> I am writing this book, <laughs> not you. You know, it was, it was getting bigger and bigger. So I had to control, but that was a, I mean, that's not someone I knew, but it was the way in which characters can, in some cases, get bigger than you thought they were, or they might shrink, or have some other point of view than you thought when you invented them. I'm not a fiction reader. No. I like autobiographies, and I was wondering if you would ever consider writing one, because your life history seems so fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> No, I um I haven't been reading much fiction either lately. <laughs> I have been reading nonfiction. But uh, several times my publisher actually asked me to write a memoir. And I said, Okay. And then I said no. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought I just can't think of anything that would just it might be interesting to readers, but it would be for me the most boring enterprise. <laughs> it's just, I know all that. <laughs> you know, I just couldn't do it. You know, I might, only if they would let me lie, <laughs> then I will do it. Thank you so much, Ms. Morrison.